Johnny, I'm glad you're here this morning and in good spirits. I followed your Seahawks last night as they, it started well, <clears throat> but it's a great morning and <clears throat> glad that you're here. It's an especially great morning because yesterday my team, the Kentucky Wildcats, went into the vile, evil, nasty, rotten Tennessee volunteers <clears throat> and took them down in that city east of hell called Knoxville. And so I wear my Kentucky tie and my little vanity tie today for celebration of such a nice, surprising victory. Uh, speaking of victory, we're glad that you experienced victory in Jesus. You're here today to share that with us. If you're visiting with us, uh, we're especially glad that you're here. Uh, we do have visitor cards in each of our foyer areas. If you would like to give us a little information about yourself, uh, if you give us an email address, we can give you further information uh, as far as uh, ongoings of Sunday school, small groups, other opportunities we gather for worship and community. Uh, also, Pastor Tim sends out a couple of video devotionals each week uh, that you can have those in your inbox and give you a little pick-me-up uh, as you go along your week uh, in serving the Lord. As far as announcements, uh, we do have printed announcements in our foyer area as well. We'd also have these online on our website. A few I'd like to bring your attention to quickly. Uh, we are still collecting uh, fall, winter, baby, and toddler clothes, all sizes up to 5T. Uh, we are doing that for the Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, we do have a, a basket in the main foyer area, so if you have any of those items with you, uh, you can drop those off today or uh, any other time that you're here as well. Also, we are having our next bingo night for our widowed and singles population on January 28th in the Fellowship Hall from 3 to 5 o'clock. Winners, once again, will receive HEB gift cards. Given the rising price of groceries, I would expect our fellowship hall will be filled to capacity. Uh, the grand prize will be a $50 HEB gift card. So just make sure you have that on your calendar. If you're a member of our singles or widowed community, that's anyone ages 18 to 105. If you're over 105, we'll consider it. Um, you're still welcome. Also, one other announcement. We have a new Sunday school class that is going to begin uh, February 5th. Our own Esther Bjorkland. Did I pronounce your last name right? Good. Don't make me say it three times fast. Um, she is starting a new Sunday school class, and this is for men and women. Okay. So, co-ed class called Drawing from the Well. There will be a book that will be used that you are asked to get your copy ahead of time from Amazon. It's $17. Also, bring a notebook. Uh, Esther is going to treat this like a real class. So, she wants you to come prepared, have your reading done, uh, have the book in hand. Uh, for anyone that would like to attend, and because of, like I mentioned before, the rising cost of groceries or getting into the pocketbook a little much, and maybe $17 could be a stretch, see me, see one of the elders, we'll make sure that that is not an obstacle uh, for your attending the class. As far as giving, I want to give you a great report. Uh, Doug Hess will have more on this uh, when he's back next week, and you'll also be getting letters in the mail for your end-of-the-year contributions. But we had a tremendous December as far as giving. Uh, because of your generosity, uh, we were able to actually be a little bit above budget for 2022. That is wonderful uh, news to give God thanks for because we had been behind most of the year, but uh, thanks to your faithful giving, we were able to finish with a little surplus. And then also on the mortgage obliteration side of things, there was also, I believe, another $20,000 that came in for the month of December to pay off uh, the mortgage debt. So again, thank you for what God has placed on your hearts uh, to give to the church and our, our missions that we support around the world and our mortgage payoff as well. As we prepare for our time of communion, I, I was thinking recently of how Satan's scheme to kill the Son of God was defeated on the cross that he had designed for Christ. And had Satan known that what he had devised by crucifying our Savior, the Messiah, had he known that it would lead to Satan's own demise and lead to life for us, he would have never gone through with that. As a matter of fact, Satan didn't even see it coming, what Jesus had in store. And so that we would never forget 
Jesus gave us our own celebration. And it reads like this in Luke 22, 19 through 20. He took the bread, he gave thanks and broke it, saying, this is my body which is given for you. He also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. A broken body, spilt blood, can anything good come from those things? Communion says yes. We serve a good God who has a good plan and he has revealed it all to us in his good book. What you face in crisis and confusion today will be your testimony of conquest in your tomorrow. I shared it with you last week, the words of Peter. I share them with you again right now. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all mercy, all provision, and all power will call you into his heavenly grace, which lasts forever. And after that little while, he will strengthen, restore, and lift you up. And that's what we celebrate in this time in a tangible way as his body. So if you would take your communion packet and take the wafer. Jesus said, this represents my body broken for you. Take and eat, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup, and he said, this represents my blood shed for you. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Well, today, uh, many of you may know that Pastor Tim is still in Sri Lanka. He and Vanessa uh, will be back next week. Uh, And there's a couple of pictures I wanted to share. This one you all got to see last week if you were here. During the 8.30 service last week while we were worshiping, uh, Pastor Tim and Vanessa led this man that you see in the middle to Christ. And if we could have the next picture a few days later, uh, Tim was able to baptize this man. Tim just sent this picture the other day. I guess we need to refer to Pastor Tim as Pastor Grumpy. (laughs) Grumpy old man. Pastor Grumpy old man. Okay. It's an interesting shirt choice. So, <laughs> but he got the job done, and thanks to your all's support, um, they're able to be in Sri Lanka and being hands and feet of God, and he'll be able to tell us more uh, about all that's taken place in the two weeks uh, that they've been uh, over there when he, gets, when he gets back and can share with us next week. But in Tim's absence, we have a very special uh, friend that's back with us once again, Pastor Brian Thomas, uh, Pastor's Life Change Church in San Antonio, Texas. And I, I made the mistake last service of saying that we were honored that he brought his uh, daughter with him. <laughs> I was corrected that it's actually his wife. I then accused him of being a cradle robber. But uh, if you don't know much about Sharon, she's quite fascinating. She is a licensed attorney also has taught law, I believe, at Liberty University, maybe at other schools as well. She also ran for Congress as a representative of San Antonio, I think 23rd District. Um, So I'm thinking maybe we should just have you come up and speak. Uh, But I I now know why Pastor Brian is on a tight leash. have an attorney wife, you're going to stay in line. So without further delay, Brian has got a wonderful sermon to share with us about spiritual growth, and I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, but it's a message that's very timely and very practical. So let's give a very warm Faith Bible Church welcome to Pastor Brian Thomas and Sharon. All right. Faith Bible. This is a home away from home. I'm so glad and delighted to spend today with you. Uh, my girlfriend, daughter, wife, uh, <laughs> we bring you greetings from the great state of San Antonio. I uh, say it's a state because it keeps on growing and growing and growing. Uh, we're just happy to be here with you today, and I'm so excited to be here um, representing uh, my friend Tim in his absence, and as they're doing some great work Uh, there in the mission field, halfway around the world, him and Vanessa, uh, my friends, our friends in ministry. And so many blessings to him and many blessings to you, Faith Bible. It's always a joy uh, to stand before you. And so I want to wish you Happy New Year. 
Uh, I was telling Richie, it's probably been a little bit more than a year or so since I've been here. Seems like forever. And so, Happy New Year. Speaking of the new year, I wonder if anybody has made any resolutions, or any goals, uh, any ambitions. I see a lot of heads shaking, no, dare not make any resolutions, because you know by February, it's like, <laughs> what resolution? <laughs> but, you know, I, I thought about this because there was a year that uh, I did make a New Year's resolution, and I wonder how many here have thought about um, any goals or ambitions or resolutions for this year to uh, grow deeper in your faith with the Lord. Anybody have any spiritual goals or ambitions or desires to go deeper? I see a few hands. Yeah. You know, I, I embarked upon that uh, goal and resolution a couple uh, years ago. And I mean, in December, I started preparing myself. Uh, there's this one year Bible that I bought that I, that I wanted to, to finish. And I had great ambitions and goals. And I mean, I, I got a new journal to take notes. I had this special fancy highlighter. Man, I was ready. I was suited up. I felt like I was ready for to go on the field. Like, Coach Simeon, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to grow. And then came, I started good. But then came the book of Leviticus. <laughs> and then Numbers. It didn't look so good after a few weeks, maybe a month. But I, I don't know about you, but in my mind, it was like, if I do this and this, then voila, I'll experience spiritual growth. You know, if I jump through this hoop and use this measuring stick to, to gain some level of, of spiritual growth, then I would have arrived. But I felt defeated. I felt frustrated. It was like, where is this one-year Bible? I want to throw it out. But I didn't. And here's the deal. I'm still going through that one-year Bible. Now, before you tell Pastor Tim that uh, haven't read from cover to cover or before you run for the exits. Let me tell you that spiritual growth has more to do than attending a class or going to a conference or anything that you yourself could imagine. Spiritual growth is interesting because only God, listen to what I'm saying, only God can produce and sustain growth. It comes from him. And I came across this inter interesting scripture as we talk about uh, this message on today. When Pastor Tim contacted me several months ago, I, I began to pray even then. And, and I sensed like the Lord was saying, I want you to bring a message about supply and demand. I'm like, isn't that an economics topic, Lord? With supply and demand. And it wasn't until only a few weeks ago when Sharon and I were having one of our morning devotions that I came across this scripture in the book of Colossians. And it's from that scripture that I want to share with you. And I believe the Lord has orchestrated, bless you, babe, orchestrated our time together today. So I want to talk about what does it take to grow spiritually? What does it take? If you're curious of how to grow spiritually, I, I want to let you know you've come on a good Sunday because we're going to discuss the three elements of spiritual growth and more importantly, what and who causes that growth. So I want you to meet me in Colossians chapter 2. This morning I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible and I'm going to pick it up in verse 13. It's here on the screen and you can follow along with me. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded these words. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive. Somebody say alive. alive. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven some of your wrongdoings. All of our wrongdoings. 
having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. That in itself, my brothers and sisters, is wonderful news. Amen? Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize by delighting in humility and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is, help me, from God. In preparation for this message, it's, it's important to understand the context in which these, Paul, these words that Paul shared are written. We understand from scripture that there was a particular heresy that was going around in the Colossian church, and, and there were certain cultural pressures to get the Colossian believers to turn their devotion away from God back to some earlier forms of deity, of mysticism, of polytheism. See, the Colossian church was made up of new Christians who had actually grown up worshiping much lesser gods. And it also had some Jewish believers. These cultural pressures were rooted in mysticism and, and polytheism and, and many held to the view that Jesus was one deity among many. There was also some cultural pressure that the new believers were to still be held subject to the Jewish law of circumcision and, and observing religious days and, and festivals. See, Jesus wanted to express himself through the words on this page and through this chapter and through this book to the Colossians that Jesus was not only a spiritual power, but the spiritual power that triumphed over all other lesser gods and spiritual powers and other deities. And as for keeping the law, Jesus fulfilled the law. The law was a shadow of things to come. Jesus was the substance, the fulfillment of that law. And so Paul, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, came to bring order to these new believers, to the church in Colossae. And as a result, he was there to um, make clear that there is not to be any mixture between the law and, and faith and grace in Jesus Christ, that there's not to be any compromise, that we can take Jesus, a little bit of Jesus, and, and a little bit of Afro, Aphrodite, and a little bit of this God, and a little bit of that God. No, he is the supreme God. And the book of Colossians, like no other book, crystallizes that image so clearly. And verse 19 is where we're going to spend the remaining portion of our time together. This verse has so much symbolism. It is steeped in, in rich understanding, and we're going to unpack many pieces of it. This verse alone, it says, And not holding firmly to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together or knit together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from the Lord. So I want to share with you, Faith Bible, some keys to spiritual growth. 
I believe that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, clearly lays out what these keys to spiritual growth are. The first being staying connected to the head. Also staying supplied by the spirit, staying knitted to one another. And all of these things together causes growth that comes from the Lord. And so I want to focus on this first aspect of staying connected to the head. You know, we're told that some in uh, Colossae were, were not holding fast to the head, which is Christ. Instead, they were believing their own way to get to God, their own traditions, their own rituals, their own idols and these lesser gods. But as Christ followers, we know that we are to hold securely. We're to hold firmly. We're to hold fast to our head. And who is our head? Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. And the body? Who's the body? We are the body. We're the different members of God's body. He's the head. We're the body made up of every believer who names the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a spiritual reality, and, and we, we understand that, but it's also important to look at it from the natural side of a human body, a head and, and a body, to, to get even further understanding and, and further depth of meaning from this scripture. Because we know that is every human being knows how essential the connection is between our head and our body. We also know how debilitating it is if there is a spinal cord injury that severs the impulses of the head from the body and vice versa. I mean, that's serious when there's a spinal cord injury. Because if the spinal cord is severed, even though the head is still physically attached, paralysis ensues. This is because communication between the head and the body is severed. And depending on the level of severity of the paralysis, there can be a total lack of sensation, a lack of blood flow, a uh, lack of muscle function and movement altogether, depending on the severity of it. Now, that reality, though, can also translate to the spiritual realm. Christ could be our head, but we feel paralyzed. Maybe situations and circumstances have, have come to interrupt or, or sever, as it were, that connection and that fellowship that we have. And although we know that we are united in Christ and Christ is in us and we are in him, sometimes we allow situations and circumstances, even ourselves or even others, to cause some degree of severing, some degree of paralysis. This condition has symptoms including a lack of interest in spiritual matters, a situation where we're not able to feel, to experience, to sense the presence of God. I, I don't know about you, but there have been seasons and times where I felt like I was going through some of this spiritual paralysis. I knew God was there. I, 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 I knew that, that he was still my head, but, but I had allowed worry and grief and other things to create this, as it were, this severing. I've been through seasons where, where prayer was, was boring, if I could be honest, where I didn't feel that connection and that true intimacy with God. And maybe you felt that same way at different times. You know, this pandemic hasn't helped. Feeling so distant and so disconnected that, that there have been times and seasons where, where honestly, sometimes we were just going through the motions. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, living for God, but not really living from God. 
Other symptoms of this spiritual paralysis include a, a lack of thirst, of drinking from the Holy Spirit, of the, the feelings and the sensations of our first love, Jesus, had, had been lost. Maybe you even once functioned and, and flowed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life, those spiritual gifts, but now you may be experiencing no movement, a lack of ability to function. If this spiritual paralysis is left untreated, it can lead to other complications like isolation, utter discouragement, and it is as if there was a severing from our life source. We, we know that, that ultimately we cannot be separated in, in our uh, relationship with the Lord once he has come into our heart and life. We believe in the eternal security of, of each believer, but there are times where you just feel so distant and so disconnected. And if you're feeling some spiritual paralysis today, I want you to know that, that it, it leads to susceptibility of, of much like the church at Colossae of, of believing some things that are not true. Believing sometimes the lie of the enemy that tries to uh, tell us that, that we uh, have disappointed God, that God no longer cares for us, that God no longer loves us. It leads to susceptibility of believing false teaching and, and false doctrine or, or worse yet, in independent living, where meaning that, that we live our lives uh, uh, independent of Christ. We, where we are not depending on him as our source or, or falling into performance-based Christianity, trying to handle life on our terms. If you're feeling some of that spiritual paralysis, I want you to just continue to lean into this message. We're going to have a time of special prayer at the end, but I believe that, that if you are sensing that or feeling that, that the Lord has brought me in this message just for you because God wants you to be in that place of knowing, of receiving that life from him, of being connected, of knowing that he is your head and that nothing and no one can separate you from that. So the first thing that leads to growth is staying connected to Christ who is our head. And, and speaking of staying connected in, in this image of a head and body, have you ever seen any headless bodies? Don't want to see any, right? It's gruesome. It's ugly. We call it a monster. But you know, sometimes when we don't hold fast to, to our head, we become like monsters. I'm looking this way because I don't want to look at my wife because she, <laughs> I've seen that monster come out and I don't like him. Tell him to go back to the pit. <laughs> but when we are not attached to our head, look, look to your neighbor and say, don't lose your head. <laughs> look to your other neighbor and say, please don't lose your head. <laughs> it's not pretty. It's gruesome. Our first point is staying connected to Christ who is our head. The second point that leads to growth is being supplied by the Spirit. Staying supplied by His Spirit. I want us to look at these verses again, and I want to share a, a new and a different verse with you as well. But this verse in Colossians 2.19 that we've been focusing on talks about being supplied. And it's the same root word of the word supply in Philippians 1.19. How about we read that together? Verse 19, uh, Philippians chapter 1. It says, for I know, I don't hear you, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The supply 
of the Spirit, staying connected to the supply of His Spirit. You know that word supplied and supply have interesting derivations. In fact, it's the same Greek word. It's this word right here. It comes from this, uh, this original Greek word. Anybody want to take a guess? I'm, I'm delaying because I'm trying to see if somebody can pronounce that for us. Yeah, that. My wife uh, actually lived on the Isle of Crete uh, uh, in Greece for a few years, so I'm going to go with your pronunciation. Yes. Epicoregia. Yeah, I think that's close enough. <laughs> Look at that word, though. What words do you see in that of our English, from our English language? Epic. And also, yeah, that there's another um, root word, huh? Choreograph, choreography. And that is exact, exactly the word. This Greek word selected to, for our word supply, uh, epikorygia, is, is to lead a chorus, to be the master conductor of a major production, an epic production. Uh, but it not only means a master conductor of this epic production, or this ancient chorus, it also means a person who both funds, underwrites, and directs this epic performance. In other words, this word wonderfully describes the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, as a master conductor who beautifully arranges and choreographs each scene of your life and lavishly supplies every need. Our God, the Holy Spirit, masterfully plans. We think our life is on autopilot or, or really has no, no uh, a start or finish. It's just haphazard. But no, the Holy Spirit masterfully plans and conducts our lives. In fact, Ephesians 2 reminds us that uh, the good works that we're to walk in have already been laid out before the foundation of the world. He already knows the plans and the purposes that he has for your life. He masterfully choreographs every detail, every scene, every act of our lives. It's not by accident. You may even be going through a hard time saying, how can God have planned this? He wants us to make a demand on his spirit, especially during times like that. Because he masterfully supplies everything that we need. Everything. Why else would he, the Holy Spirit have chosen such a beautiful word to describe our lives and the fact that, that he takes care of planning, of choreographing, of orchestrating every detail of our lives and makes grand and lavish provision for our lives. It's beautiful. It's amazing that as the Father has beautifully choreographed our lives, he has lavishly supplied his spirit for every scene and every act of our lives. Now, you may wonder, because I do at times, that through his son and his spirit, he, God has lavishly supplied everything that we need. But I feel and perhaps you feel at times that you're overwhelmed and undersupplied at times. Am I the only one that feels like that? Are y'all going to leave me hanging? Okay. Sometimes you feel overwhelmed and undersupplied. 
You may feel this way when when life circumstances, when troubled relationships, when life just seems to get the best of you. Well, if you feel that way or if you felt that way in the past, I have two illustrations to answer that. But the first one is going to have to require us to go back to economics class. You remember that? I hope you pass economics because we're going to be trying to rely on your knowledge this morning. If that was middle school, high school, even college. But let's go back to economics class and, and let's look at this law of supply and demand. See, this law of supply and demand reflects the relationship between demand and supply in that the change in one causes a change in the other. Now, according to this law, when there is a higher demand for a commodity, there is also a rise in the supply of that commodity and vice versa. The law of supply and demand explains this interaction between the desire for a product and the supply of that product. Now, what does all this have to do with with this scripture? Well, here's what I believe it has to do with this scripture. If you're feeling overwhelmed and undersupplied by his spirit, make a demand. Make a demand. I'll say that loud for the ones in the back. Make a demand on his spirit. You say, a, a, a demand? I, I believe God loves to be brought into remembrance of his word. I believe that, that God in his word reminds us that he has supplied every need. He has given us every spiritual blessing. He has made a way. And yes, I believe that we are to make a demand. Why do I say that? Well, we got a couple scriptures that we could turn to for reference. You remember the scripture and Sermon on the Mount? He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. What? shall be filled. Hunger. Get hungry. Get thirsty for more of his spirit. Make a demand. And what does God say? I'll turn you away. I'll give you a stone even though you ask for bread. No, I will supply all of your needs. You will be filled. Another verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and... All these things shall be added. Make a demand. <clears throat> when a demand uh, is made, the supply is supplied. So supply is supplied only to the degree that the demand is demanded. You get that? You'll get that on your way home. But I have another illustration, and I had to rely on, on uh, some valued authority because this analogy has to do with breastfeeding. So guys, don't try this at home. This, this, yeah, this, this, this won't translate. But, but my wife reminded me that, that uh, in breastfeeding, that even though uh, she didn't feel there was enough milk, that w- once our firstborn latched on, The milk was supplied. I remember our our firstborn who had a nurse, seemed like all night. And but soon early in the morning, she wanted to nurse again. And and my wife is like, "It's, it's no more. It's all gone. But our baby in faith latched on and started suckling. And the demand, the milk flowed, the supply of milk flowed. What are we saying? That, that God wants us to lay out, to stretch out, to make a demand of him, of his spirit, because he says it's, it's like a, a limitless supply. He lavishly supplies all that we need. So I want to encourage us to have faith like our firstborn child that said, oh, no, mama, you're going you're to produce some milk today because I'm making a demand. That's how I believe God wants us to be as it relates 
to his spirit. Why? Because his spirit does so much. His spirit, he comforts us in our afflictions. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit wants to be our teacher. The Holy Spirit is there to advocate for us. The Holy Spirit waters and refreshes us. The Holy Spirit even prays for us when we have no words to pray of our own. Make a demand. I don't know, but there's been times and seasons in, in my own life recently, you know, being a minister and a pastor, uh, people are always looking to you to, to supply them with a word, with some encouragement. Well, I got to be honest, and I got to be a little bit vulnerable that during this season, it's been really hard. It's been hard because of dealing with uh, uh, transitioning uh, work and work assignments, but also... Um, having to make some, some terribly difficult decisions for, for our mom who, who is um, preparing to go into hospice. And when they first threw that word at me, I, I just felt assaulted. I just felt assaulted. And I felt like, man, this is, this is, this is one of the hardest seasons that, that, that we've had to go through in a while. And but yet and still the the demand to be the pastor and to come up with a word. And you know how it is as, as moms, especially moms of, of uh, your single mom. And sometimes you don't feel like you have anything else to give. You don't have anything else to offer. And I don't know what what uh, scene of life that depicts for you when you feel so depleted and so empty. You know, I felt like that. I felt like, uh, uh, but I had, to, I had to go preach a sermon. I had to go teach a Bible study. And, and I just got it in my, in my closet, in my, my, my little office and said, Lord, I don't have anything to give. I'm so empty. And it was like, I've, since the Holy Spirit said, that's fine. That's a good spot to be in. Because now I can feel you. Make a, make a demand, Brian. I know you can't do it by yourself. You weren't equipped to do this by yourself. Make a demand. And I tell you, the Lord came through again and again and again. Make a demand of his limitless supply of his spirit. Amen? So stay connected to the head. Stay supplied by his spirit. And lastly, stay knitted to one another. You know, this, this scripture where it talks about the head, the body being supplied and, and knit together by the joints and the ligaments. I want to talk about joints and ligaments. And whenever I see that, man, I think, man, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> I got some joints and some ligaments. I, in fact, I was telling my mom, she said, I got something just for that, some liniment. I'm like, some liniment? What's a lin liniment for my ligaments? And I, I got home, and, I, and found, this is for horses. <laughs> what is my... Uh, she gave me some liniment, for, but you know that stuff worked? <laughs> it gave me increased mobility. <laughs> but ligaments is that connective tissue that joins together two bones or holds together a joint. And, and what is Paul trying to convey and to express to us? That as members of the body of Christ, that we are to be knitted together. Just like that connective tissue that connects the, the, that ligament that connects the bones or holds together joints. Paul was encouraging the Colossian believers to stay connected to one another. Just like those ligaments connect bones together in the human body. And as members of the body of Christ, we are to be knitted and connected together. In other words... 
We need one another. You know, when I think about knitting and knit, and my wife told me that's the wrong needle up there. That's not a knitting needle. That's a crochet needle. Okay, it was the best I could come up with. <laughs> but, but, you know, one, if you're by yourself, you know, one strand of yarn, okay, that's, that's nice and that's cute or whatever. But it's nothing like having all of that weaved and integrated into a beautiful tapestry. And that, that's how it is when we come together. That's actually one element of growing together. You know, you can't very well grow and experience everything that God wants you to do in a test tube, in a silo, in a vacuum. He wants us to get out, to mingle, to be with one another, to rub off on one another. And even when we rub one another the wrong way, he wants us to learn some things from that. That's really where the growth is. And that's why there are a plethora of different scriptures where it talks about one anothering each other. That's why there are 40, nearly 50 one another's in the New Testament alone. Be at peace with each other. Love one another. Honor one another above ourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Serve one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other. Encourage one another. And the list goes on and on and on. If we're going to grow, we got to be in community. So what does that look like for Faith Bible? That, that looks like joining a small group. Being connected with other believers and studying the word of God together. That means being uh, in men's group or women's group, just, just coming together so that we can learn together and so that we can one another each other. We were all made for community. And I, I know uh, you may even be listening by, by way of social media and, and online. And thank God you are. But it's nothing like coming together and being together. There's really no substitute. Why? Because actually God said that we're supposed to be in community with one another. Knitted together. It's hard to be knitted together when we're isolated or away from community. We were made for community. Amen? So our spiritual growth involves how well we want another each other. So how are you functioning in your role as, a, as ligament and joints? I mean, are you properly exercising your gift of encouraging one another, loving one another, forgiving one another, making allowances for one another's faults, honoring one another, and really being connected? To one another. Here's a beautiful thing that, that we'll end with. I, I love the end part of verse 19. It says that as we are fully connected to the head, state supplied by his spirit, connect to one another, we will grow. We will grow with the grove that can only come from God. Talk about spiritual growth. That growth only comes from God. God is the one who causes growth as we work in concert with him, as we engage in relationship with him. That's the growth that can only come from God. I told you we were going to have a time of special prayer at the end, and, and I just want to encourage you today that if you are feeling disconnected, discouraged, disjointed, disengaged, if you're feeling a, a, a sense of spiritual paralysis, where you can't seem to, to, to get going, 
or, or there's a, a coldness in your intimacy with the Lord. And it seems like something's awry. I want you to know that I believe God sent me in this message to remind you that he's madly in love with you. That he wants to be an intimate relationship with you. That perhaps we've allowed situations and circumstances to distract us from our head. But today, the Lord wants to reconnect and rejoin. And all we have to do is simply surrender. Don't get ahead of yourself and try to figure out, well, I got to do this, I got to do that. No, just simply stay connected to your head. Just humbly submit and surrender and admit that we don't know how to get back. But all we have to do is surrender and the Lord will, will wonderfully orchestrate and choreograph this scene and the next scene, the next stage of life, and the one after that. Because the Lord has wonderfully supplied everything that we need for life and for godliness. And so I want to invite you in this, I believe, sacred space of prayer. And I want to encourage you just to simply bow your head and close your eyes because I believe the Lord has sent this word for you that may be experiencing some spiritual paralysis. You feel stuck. You don't sense the, the Lord's presence like you once did. Whatever that separation or severance is, the Lord says, that's then and this is now. The Lord wants to bring you into fullness, into completeness. He already has at the cross. But sometimes it's us. It's never the Lord who backs away. If you're feeling separated, disconnected from God, if you're feeling disjointed, discombobulated, disengaged, the Lord in his love and grace and mercy has sent this word to lovingly remind you, stay connected to the head. Stay supplied by the Spirit, by making those demands upon his Holy Spirit. Staying connected and knitted to one another. If you feel that this word has found you and maybe you're feeling a little bit of paralysis while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I just want to have the privilege of praying for you. Would you just simply raise your hand and say, this word found me today. This word was for me. I see your hands. I, I see your hands. Praise God. You could put your hands down. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that when we feel so disconnected, so disassembled, be honest, Lord, sometimes we feel like a wreck, a mess. But Lord, I thank you that even when we feel stuck and those feelings and emotions and experiences and realities that we once shared with you are a memory of the distant past, that I believe that you want to do a new thing. I believe, Father, that you want to reconnect and reconcile, Lord, those spaces, those gaps 
And Father, where the severing occurred, I believe, Father, you want to mend and heal by your Holy Spirit. And so today, for those that raise their hand, Lord, I thank you for sending this word to remind them to simply yield and surrender and allow you to bring the growth that only you can bring. I thank you for the new thing that you have done and that you are doing. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for reconnecting us, for reestablishing us, for rejoining us to our purpose and passion in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Five Faith Bible. I was going to say Faith, man. It's Faith Bible. It's been a joy to be able to be back with you today. And as we prepare to dismiss, I'm just going to ask everybody to stand. Thank you for your graciousness and hospitality for my wife and I and uh, our church. We bring you uh, greetings and we trust that this won't be the last time that we'll see you soon again. But I just wanted to pray a blessing over you as you go into your day, into your week. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. And we just pronounce your blessings that the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord calls his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you.